Hi, I'm Jan Benhelm, and this presentation is for people interested in taking a shortcut in their attempt to build a quantum computer based on superconducting and spin qubits. Let me start with a brief introduction of Zurich Instruments. We are a Swiss company founded in 2008 to disrupt the lock and amplifier market and have grown then uh, to a multinational operation with close to 100 people. With many physicists, engineers, computer scientists on board, I think it's fair to say we are a company of scientists for scientists. Whenever we do a new project or develop a new product, we go and look for the most exquisite parts on the market, of course, to provide adequate speed, high sensitivity, low noise, and high resolution. But this is what everybody does, and uh, including our customers. So the place where we can really differentiate and make a difference is on the software side. And here we have Lab 1, one of the most innovative platforms to control instrument. This is where our customers can save time and do things they otherwise could not do or not do as fast. And the best part of it, the software gets updated uh, frequently over time. So your instruments also get better over time and that is free of charge. Here on the right, you see a number of instruments that we do, and you see it's uh, very much focused on the physics community. And so it comes at no surprise that we engage on the topic of quantum computing a couple of years ago, where we see an excellent match to our strength and also mission to help scientists and engineers to push the edge by providing the best scientific instruments for their research. So it came only naturally that we partnered with some of the leading groups uh, in the world to develop the world's first quantum computing control system, or QCCS. This QCCS was launched in 2018 and tailored to superconducting and spin qubits, but we also have customers in iron traps, uh, color centers, and other technologies around. Now, the main idea here is that the scientists can actually focus on what really matters to them and not lose their precious time on building stuff they have not the full expertise for and let us concentrate on the engineering problem. So where does this QCCS actually fit in? Uh, the graph here on the left shows a very simplified version of the so-called quantum stack or the essential layers required to building a quantum computer. On the lowest level, you see where all the magic happens. This is where the qubit are, qubits are, and Christian here is holding a chip that, can, that has seven qubits, and which they used recently for repeated quantum error correction in a surface code. Very exciting results. Uh, so this is clearly the field of experimental physicists uh, pushing, pushing the boundaries. On the other side of the stack, you have the applications. And this is where eventually the, the paying customers will be and also the value is generated. Now, every of those applications has to be translated into algorithm. This can be done to a large extent irrespective of the choice of qubits. However, the closer you get to the magic, the more you have to take care of the specific capabilities and problems associated with the type of qubit you use. And eventually you have to connect the algorithms to the qubits. And this is exactly our business. So we provide the transmission gear between the qubits and the software layer. The picture here on the right shows the front and the back uh, of a QCCS setup at ETH. So this setup uh, will be designed to control about 20 qubits. So this looks like a lot of electronics. Uh, and this is actually needed because control of qubits require analog signals compared to digital signals in a classical computer. And so you have the signal generation, which is really pure, accurate, and well-timed control, and the signal measurement, so reading out a qubit requires extremely high sensitivity to be fast, accurate, uh, enough to provide feedback again to the setup uh, according to the algorithm. Now, we consider ourselves as being successful when all of those aspects are actually no longer your concern. All of this should not really worry you. So, I want to invite you now to have a closer look with me on one of these uh, setups. So here we have uh, QCCS, where the largest part of the real estate is actually by, taken by the signal generation. So we have uh, uh, 
arbitrary waveform generators for the baseband. You have uh, two channels then translated with this IQ modulation and a local oscillator into the microwave domain. The AWGs can also be used to control flux lines, for instance, and other parts of the setup. Now, on the qubit measurement side, uh, the real estate is a bit less demanding because uh, a lot of setups today use a single readout line to detect multiple qubits at the same time. And these instruments can actually read out 10 qubits at a time. Now, to have everything of all of these uh, instruments in sync, we need a programmable quantum system controller here on top that assures that the entire setup runs like a clockwork, so you get full predictability, full repeatability in your setup. Uh, this also takes care of uh, taking information produced, for instance, by the measurements in the quantum analyzers, ca makes calculations, process this information, and redistribute this uh, throughout the setup as needed. There is still quite some space here on an FPGA for custom applications. Last but not least, the Lab1 software assures a smooth connection to higher software layers, so you can work with Python, Qiskit, QCodes, and Labber, and so forth. As you see, this is quite a modular approach, and uh, each of the individual instrument actually comes with uh, quite some functionality, and the idea is that most of the stuff is actually done as close to the qubit as possible, and you have uh, a minimal overhead on the system controller side, and also minimum latency, so fast feedback and so forth and so forth. Where do we want to go with this? And here's a slide that shows our quantum roadmap for the next couple of years. And you see two strong development paths. Most of the attention today is, of course, on the big system with breakthroughs like Google's announcement of quantum supremacy dictating the headlines. We are really proud to be involved in some of such endeavors. Uh, most notably and public is the European Open SuperCube project, where we aim to realize 100 working qubits by the end of 2021. And we certainly see today that our technology can be used even beyond these numbers. While this is really exciting, most of the work is actually done uh, in this area where people use only a few qubits to investigate new materials, uh, other gate operations, new types of qubits, and so on and so on. Now, let me give you a few examples of uh, installations that are known to the public. So we talked about quantum device. There is uh, quantum inspire. I will say a few words about that as well. There's the Berkeley lab, uh, all of these with uh, superconducting qubit. Quantum inspire also has spin qubits. We have uh, IQM in Finland, uh, a startup company commercializing on lab in the box, and we have Intel. Now do you see there's a good variety, a good mix of different endeavors. And some of the recent success stories are here given on the right. Uh, I already mentioned the Surface 7 uh, implementation at ETH. And then there is a few more I want to detail in the, in the upcoming slides. Let's dive a little deeper into two qubit gate operations, which are a very essential and important uh, building block and certainly a place and an area where breakthroughs happen. So the better the gate, the longer and the more complex algorithms you can do within your limited coherence time. From an instrumentation perspective, uh, what does it need to make good gates? So you certainly need good timing and amplitude accuracy, no drifts and chitter. You need sufficient bandwidth uh, to make it sufficiently fast and well controlled still. And you need high signal purity, so no spurious and low noise and so forth and so forth. In short, what you want is you want control electronics that is not the limiting factor of your gate operations. Now, what is the state of the art here? IBM recently published uh, a paper on the preprint on the archive, I think in March, where they showed a two qubit gate operations done with one of our AWGs, where they achieved 99.76 gate fidelity in only about four nanoseconds time. And they characterized this gate by randomized benchmarking with up to 200 individual gate pulses. Now, this is really very encouraging and impressive. But at the same time, even the best gates come with small errors, and these accumulate quickly and render larger algorithms useless. So we have to eventually deal with these errors. Uh, 
And one way of doing so is the ability of having fast and intelligent feedback. Now, there is different ways, uh, there's different uh, levels how to implement that, and I want to give three examples. So faster feedback can help to speed up the clock cycle for initial uh, state preparation and increase the fidelity. We have uh, ancilla qubit reset in quantum error correction and, of course, the full-fledged uh, quantum error correction. Now, how fast can we do this? And the answer is, it, it depends. The most simple approach is what we call event-based, and this is uh, you provide a simple trigger line to one of our signal generators and then ask yourself how quickly can you change the analog output, and the answer to this question is 50 nanoseconds. This is the shortest of all shortcuts, if you will, and the best performance on the market today, but it's also somewhat limited in scope. And so let's have a look at uh, another solution, which we call a point-to-point. -point. And here you have this uh, quantum analyzer, which takes the analog signal from the qubits in, uh, does the detection, and then puts the result over this DIO fixed link to the uh, signal generator, which can then decide how to continue with the sequence and produce a different analog output. This takes about 380 nanoseconds and does not include the signal integration for the qubit measurement. So with that, you can do something like qubit initialization, ancilla qubit reset, and uh, last year, the ETH crew published a paper on entanglement stabilization where they kept uh, some belt states alive for longer than the coherence time would actually suspect. Now, the full-fledged uh, QCCS or end-to-end -end feedback is uh, depicted here. So this includes basically the uh, uh, accumulation of all the measurement results in a central place, the PQSC in this case, the processing, and then the redistribution into the system to change the, uh, the pathway of the algorithm. Uh, this is quite involved, and you can see it takes today about 700 nanoseconds, which is in stark contrast to the four nanosecond gate time. And you can trust us, uh, we have high motivation to get this uh, time down and uh, further speed up the whole process. This is something we are working on at the moment. Let me conclude my presentation with uh, mentioning a very exciting recent project, which is uh, earlier this year in April, Quantum Inspire, the first European quantum computer in the cloud, went live. This project by QTech, which is TU Delft and TNO in the Netherlands, makes use of two backends. So one is two single electron spin qubits, and the other one five superconducting transmon qubits. Uh, in both setups, uh, our instruments are used to control the qubits. Both setups can be controlled from a web browser from anywhere in the world. This project had, of course, very demanding requirements uh, regarding performance, but also regarding reliable and stable operation. I would say we learned a tremendous amount from working with the people in Delft during this time. And I want to take the opportunity to say thank you for letting us be part of this exciting journey. Congratulations to this great success. And with this, I want to conclude my presentation and hope you get uh, some inspiration and an idea how you could possibly benefit from our years of experience working with some of the best groups around. We would be thrilled if you give us the opportunity to discuss your project. So thank you for your attention, and we hope to speak to you soon.